All right, welcome everyone to Map Time Davis. Um, we're nearing the end of the quarter, and I'm super excited today that we're going to be learning about Google Earth Engine. We haven't had an Earth Engine workshop in a while, so um, I'm really glad that we've got this one on deck today. Um, I'm going to paste a couple links in the chat for you, um, well, specifically the schedule. Um, you know, it doesn't matter because it's not, this was supposed to be the end of the uh, quarter. We have a new workshop that's coming up uh, next quarter, and I'll send out information about that on the geospatial email list, but it's not in our schedule yet, so it doesn't matter if I link it to you. Um, but keep your eyes peeled. Um, we're going to have Nate Roth talk next week about um, some of the data that the state has been creating, um, which should be a really good talk, and I'll get more details out on the geospatial list about that soon. Um, so again, welcome to Map Time Davis. My name is Michelle Tobias. I don't think I introduced myself, got sidetracked. Um, I am the geospatial data specialist at UC Davis Data Lab. Um, and what is Map Time? Um, I'm glad you're here. Uh, and if you don't know what Map Time is, it is a time for making maps. Literally, that's all it is. Um, there are Map Time chapters throughout the world, and they each have their own kind of flavor that supports their attendees and their participants. And because we are on a UC campus at a research university, we tend to be a little bit more research flavored than others. Um, and we're also supported by UC Davis Data Lab. So that also um, is another good reason why we tend to be a little bit more research oriented. Um, but hopefully this meets the needs of our participants. So um, I know I'm, I'm always learning things that I put to use in my job at map time. So. Um, hopefully you are as well. Um, so a little bit about Data Lab is we are a, an organization on campus and we support researchers at all levels, so students, faculty, staff, um, with their data needs specifically related to data science, but anything basically data related we're happy to talk to you about. We have office hours uh, once a week on Wednesdays from 1.30 to 3 o'clock right now via Zoom. Um, and you're welcome to come chat with us just about anything. Um, we tend to focus on open source tools so um, and concepts. So if you have questions about those, we're happy to help. Um, if you're working with proprietary software, we're happy to help with concepts and workflow ideas, but we may not be able to answer specific questions about um, proprietary software just because that's not what we spend our time with. But um, you're welcome to come chat with us. And um, I'm really excited that Data Lab allows us time to create things like Map Time Davis so that we can get together, have a community, and learn some things together. So that being said, today we have Luke Salvato. He is going to present um, about Google Earth Engine today. And like I said, I'm really excited about this because it's been a long time since I've had my hands in Earth Engine. So I think with that, I will turn it over to Luke and we will get started. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, I'm Luke. I'm a PhD student in soil and biogeochemistry. Um, my research is about land use change in the in California's Central Valley. And uh, I would not call myself uh, an Earth Engine super user, but I do use it for my research. Mostly I use it to ingest satellite imagery, uh, process the imagery, and then use the imagery to detect changes over time. So I'm looking at changes over the past 20 years. Um, all right, so thanks for being here. I know it's a busy time in the quarter. Um, I'll try and get to it. First, we're gonna do a quiz. Just kidding, it's not a quiz, it's a poll. Um, so Michelle, if you could administer the poll, please. That'd be great. <clears throat> so hopefully you all see the poll pop up. All right, looks good. Thanks, everybody. Uh, okay, there's one question I forgot. Um, and I want to ask how comfortable you are with NDVI. Um, so maybe in the in the chat box, uh, on a scale from zero to five, zero means you've never heard of NDVI before. Five would mean you could write the NDVI uh, computation you know, without looking it up and you, you know, maybe you've used it before in your own work. Uh, so on a scale of zero to five, how comfortable are you with NDVI? Okay, maybe please type that one into the chat box. Okay, nice. All right, thanks everybody. Okay, that's gonna help me 
figure out where to spend my time. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here. I'm gonna start with a presentation. How's that look? Can you see that? Yeah, it looks good. We can see the slides. Okay. All right. So this is Earth Engine. Um, okay. Earth Engine is a software, a cloud-based software that allows you to do Earth science data analysis uh, at the planet scale. And they're hosting a ton of data, almost 20 petabytes of data uh, on their servers. And you can access and work with this data through their APIs, which can be done in JavaScript or Python. Uh, it's, it's a little easier to do it in JavaScript and we'll do it in Java today for teaching. If you are a Python user and you're already really comfortable with Python, it can be done, um, but it's quite a bit more complicated than using the code editor, which is ready to go with, with Java. So we're gonna stick with Java today. Um, and you can also compute algorithms, you can process data, you can make visualizations in Google Earth Engine. Um, but for most use cases that I've seen, especially in the research space, a lot of us are using Earth Engine to ingest big data, big images, do some preliminary processing, get the data we need from them, and then we export that data. And in my case, I end up using most of, you know, doing most of my work in R. So I'm doing kind of preliminary processing and ingesting and kind of checking some stuff out in Earth Engine. And then I usually export and I work in R. All right, um, and and they ho they're hosting a lot of data. You know, they started with Landsat when Landsat first became publicly available, I think in 1990 something. Uh, but since then, they've added Modis, Sentinel One. They ha have some pre-made products from the US um, DA. There's a lot of different data sources in there, um, and they're adding new data every day. Okay, and you can do a lot of different types of things on their data. You know, you know, first we often will work with just a single image. You can get different bands from that image. You can clip the image. You can do different uh, you know, types of processes on one image, but you can also do it on an image collection, which is like a, a stack of images you know, over time. You can aggregate them, you can filter them. You can add a feature to them like a geometry and, and uh, look at specific things within the geometry. You can do a reducer, which is, is Kind of Earth Engine speak for a computation. Um, oftentimes, we'll like reduce something by computing the mean within a geometry. That's like a, a pretty common one, but there's a lot of different types of reducers, and there's a lot of uh, ways to do them in Earth Engine. All right, so you can also join things. You can export data so that you can work with it, you know, in a software you're more familiar with. You can also do machine learning and projections. So you can use Earth Engine for like classification and you can map your classification back across the feature space. Um, there's a lot of different potential applica applications to use in the software. All right. Um, so a, a satellite image might, it might often look like this when you first get it, right? Uh, it can be kind of difficult to work with when it's like that. And Earth Engine is making it relatively easier to take an image like this and make it look like that, where you can actually use it for examining things that are on the surface of the earth. And in, in some cases, they've actually pre-processed images to filter the clouds away already. So you can go ahead and get the, the cloud filter version. Um, you can also put together a lot of different satellite images into what's called a mosaic. So this is like a bunch of, you know, the, the satellites covering the earth and taking strips of images with each passing and earth engine will automatically mosaic them together for you. So you can make relatively pretty images like this. And then you can even make what's, call, what's called a composite from different sources of data light imagery. And you can kind of make pretty images that look like this one. Uh, in this case, this is what's actually used for the background of like your Google Maps application or the background of a Google Earth application. Okay. Um, so I'll briefly, some things that you can do in Earth Engine. The first thing you can do is you can get an image. You can specify an image with a projection. You can specify resolution. You can, you know, each image will have certain bands, um, and you can apply an algorithm to that image. And you can, you know, there's a huge library of algorithms you can use. You can also build your own if you have a special use case. You can get an image collection and filter the image collection over time, over space, by metadata. You can 
map an algorithm over a collection. Mapping is is like the computer science version of mapping. I'm, I'm not talking about like cartographic mapping. This is uh, like mapping an algorithm over uh, a collection of, of images. You can do a reduction. So I, you know, in this case, you might take a collection of Im images, map an algorithm over it to compute something like NDVI. And then you could compute the highest NDVI in that time series of images and take only the highest. That's an example of, of a mapping something over an image collection and then doing a reduction on that. Okay, and then you can also compute some aggregate statistics. You can visualize these things in Earth Engine, but you can also export CSV files or other types of files and work with them in your own software. All right, any questions on any of that stuff? If you have a question, you can you can type it into the into the chat. We have some helpers here who will um, you know the answer there for you. If you want to speak up and ask a question out loud, that's fine too. Uh, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. All right. So now we can get started with the meat and potatoes of this thing. Hopefully you have all um, set up a Google account and registered for Earth Engine. If you haven't, you can start that now, but I, I don't think I'd even suggest it. I think you maybe just follow along and kind of watch me go through the, the coding aspect of this um, and then work on this stuff later. And all of my scripts are here. So I'm gonna copy this and paste this into the chat box. So if you have Earth Engine already, you can open that. And this is like the equivalent of a, a shared folder um, in Google Drive or something. You're now a reader of this folder. Hopefully that works. If it doesn't work, let me know. Um, so if you can open that, um, it should pop up in your Earth Engine thing uh, under this reader header. So you, you're now a reader of all of those scripts and you can run them, check them out, um, but you can't change them because you're only a reader. Okay. So I'll let everyone take a minute to get that up and running before I move on to the next part. All right, give me a give me a reaction if you're um let me see this here. If you have the my scripts up on your Earth engine on your own machine, give me a is it a thumbs up? Yeah, give me a thumbs up or a green checkbox actually. Give me a green checkbox. And if you don't, uh, give me an X. And I'll you know, I'll kind of gauge it from there. All right, looks like we have a fair amount of yeses. That's good news. Okay. And now you also see my uh, my Earth Engine screen share, right? Okay, thanks for the feedback. Okay, so I'll give you a little um, intro here to Earth Engine. This is what it looks like. In the middle here is where we do most of our scripting. This is where we type our code. Um, over here is where you can manage all of your scripts. 
you know, I, I've done a lot of work in here. So I have, you know, a lot of files and messes going on and stuff like that. Um, down below at the bottom, there are some examples here. And actually you can just click these. And these are some pre-made code that are designed to help you kind of understand what's going on. So there's a lot to go through there if, if you're curious, um, but I don't really suggest it as a way to start. Um, there's also the inside of this left pan here, there's docs. These are all the different types of tools you can use in, in Earth Engine. Um, so these are all different functions basically. And then you have some assets here. You know, these are things that I've uploaded into Earth Engine for my own work. Um, we're not going to do any of that today. So that's something maybe for you know a more intermediate user. So I'll go back to this scripts pane here. Um, and I'm going to just clear this script because I don't want to look at that for now. Over here is my console. You know, there'd be things that pop up here. This is where you'll get your error messages. Um, if you're running something, it will be running in here. And I'll show you the inspector in a little bit later. Um, this is it, right? This is it. And this is not the most user-friendly kind of interface. Like this is decent for your own work, but it's not something you'd want to share with like a land manager or with a stakeholder or something, right? So um, I'll just briefly show you there are apps. You can build like something complicated in here and then turn it into an app with this app button. And Earth Engine has some apps that they, you know, these are kind of fancy ones that you can look at. Um, if you want to look at these some other time, but for example, like I'll open this one for you. All right, this is an app that someone made and they're featuring on the web page here. It was pretty cool, right? Showing Earth's surface temperature. You can like click on the map and it will generate some new data on that point where I've just clicked. You can like move around and look at stuff. Um, this is an example of an app. You, you could do this if you, you know, if you really wanted to share some visualization or some data with, with someone um, in a user friendly way. Okay. So I'll go back code here and let's go to the intro to Java, the first in these series of scripts here. And I'll just do a brief intro to Java so we can get kind of comfortable with most of some of these Java lines, Java uh, types of code. First thing is that uh, it uses double slash to make a comment, okay? You can also do a multi-line slash using this with like a backslash and an asterisk. Um, that's a way to put multiple lines of, of code into comments all at once. To make a variable, you use this VAR function. This is the variable that you're specifying here, and that's going to equal 42. Okay, to make a string, you may you can use single quotation marks. And most of the time you end lines of code with the semicolon like that. Okay, you can also use double quotation marks for strings. Um, and you can print stuff with this print function. Okay, so I'm gonna run this here. And now you can see some stuff is popping up in my console. And the first thing is this string will print the console tab. You know, that's because I asked it to print that. All right, you can also make a list with square brackets. You know, things are separated by commas and the things inside of this are strings because they have the quotation marks. And then if I want to print the first object in my list, I specify that with square brackets and I'll, I'll print the zero object, which means the first object. You know, so when I run that, that's why eggplant is printing here. Okay. Um, and so let's say, for example, I did not have, you know, I, I kind of missed a quotation mark there. If I run that, this is often what the code message, the code will, the error message will pop up in the console and it will try its best to, you know, kind of direct you to where that issue is and determine string constant. So that one's like pretty useful, right? So I, I kind of guessing that I need to put something there. Um, and then I can try running again and now it works. Um, but indeed one of the earth engine weaknesses is, is like the, if you're used to our studio, like I am, you know, I think the error messages in our studio have gone pretty good over the years, but in earth engine, I, I think they're still a little bit difficult sometimes to process. Okay. Um, 
So we'll keep going here. You can also make, uh, you can use curly brackets to make a dictionary. Okay, so in this case, we have a dictionary of food and the item inside of food is bread. We have a color and the color is red and we have a number and the number is 42. And I wanna print my dictionary, which is this variable I made here. And I wanna print the color. Okay, well, when I run that, it's you know, that's why it's printing red here. You can also specify with this syntax. So there's some flexibility in JavaScript, okay? You can ask it to print my dictionary dot color, and that will also print red. Okay, then you can also build functions in Java with the function function. Okay, in this case, I'm asking this function to accept a string, and then it's going to return hello plus that string plus an ex exclamation point. Okay, so now I'm gonna print, that's my hello function. So this is the, my custom function I just made and I'm gonna pass to it map time. And so it's gonna put map time here and add hello and exclamation point to it. And that's why we're getting hello map time here. Again, I know that these can be pretty difficult to keep track of sometimes. So if you're doing more complicated work, you could add, let's see if this works. I'll add to this thing a name, let's call it function and run this. Now this is gonna help me keep track a little bit because I've given this printed thing a little name, okay? Everybody with me? I'll assume that's a yes. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to put them in the chat. I don't see any in there yet. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is some live coding. I would suggest maybe just to follow along and just see how I do it. Um, and then take these scripts on your own and, and run them later. If you have them up, you can run them, but I'm gonna kind of try and do it live for you so you can see a little bit what the workflow is like, okay? Um, so I'm gonna clear my script here. Okay, so for fun, let's pull up um, there's a digital elevation data set called SRTM. I'm going to search for that here. And that's the one I want. So I'm going to pick that one and you can take a look at it. You know, it gives you this information about it, you know, shows you who the provider is. You can look at an example of it if you want. It gives you a little bit of a visualization of it here. You can check what bands are in this thing. And there's only one band. Okay. And it's, it's elevation. Uh, the name is elevation and the min value is minus 444 and the max is Mount Everest. And we have 90 meter resolution, okay? And then I'm gonna import that, but instead of calling it um, image of the name, it's RTM, okay? And now I want to map that. I wanna take a look at it. So there's a function called map dot add a layer. And I want, Control space is a shortcut to get this to autofill. Okay, and there's a bunch of shortcuts. If you go to this help thing here, go to general shortcuts, there's a bunch of, uh, oops, sorry. There's a bunch of shortcuts in here that can help with other things. Um, and one, one nice one is this commenting shortcut because you can't actually run stuff line by line in Earth Engine. So you have to sort of comment out everything but that one line if you're trying to troubleshoot and run things one line at a time. Okay, so back to back to this. Let's do um, map dot add layer SRTM, and I'm going to run that. And now it's producing my map of elevation, but it's not so pretty right now. I need to add some stuff to it. Um, so let's one way to do this is control space, and this is going to sort of get, tell me what all of the different arguments in this map dot add layer function need to be. And the object I know is SRTM, this params, um, because I'm using this software, I sort of know this, but basically you, you need to have curly brackets, oops. And then inside of the curly brackets, we'll specify a min. So I'm gonna say min is zero and max elevation is, uh, let's do 1000 meters for now. And we'll run that. Okay, now that's giving me a little bit more to look at, all right? But all this stuff is sort of washed out. That's probably because I didn't specify my max as high enough for you know looking at the Western US. 
And in my layers pane, I can see my map here. And this is called layer one. I can turn it off if I want to. I can turn it back on. I can change the opacity of it. And it also might get confusing eventually if I just call this layer one. So let's give it a name, which will look like that. Okay, now, and also I'll change this here to maybe fourth 5,000. Let's try that, 5,000 meters. And you might be wondering, how do I know that that's in meters? And I can go back to this metadata here, and it should tell me that the units are meters right there. Okay. So now this is a little better. Maybe let's let's see if this is three thousand. Okay, that's decent. You know, we're going to look at the Western U.S. You can also um, click on this settings thing here, and I currently have this custom range from zero to 3000. I could stretch my range to maybe let's include 98% of the data. So that's gonna go from you know, 70 meters to 3,600 or so. And let's apply that. Import it, see if, no, I don't wanna do that actually. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this variable here. Okay. So that's looking pretty good. And now if I go to my inspector, I have these little crosshair things and I could like click around on this mountain next to Salt Lake and it will tell me the elevation of that mountain. Okay, it also give me the coordinates of that point, um, kind of giving some information on the image there. There's a lot going on in these libraries. Um, so I won't go into it too much for this. All right, so the other thing you could do is search around here for a place. And let's go to the Grand Canyon because Grand Canyon is a pretty good place to, why isn't that coming up? And let's do this one. It's not working. I try, oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's just taking its time here. All right, so I've just searched for the Grand Canyon and it will take my map there directly. And so now we're looking over the Grand Canyon. And I can turn this off so I know I'm there. Um, and if you have this on, it's basically computing this on the fly. So every time you scroll somewhere, it's gonna take a second and then it's gonna compute all these pixels that are currently in your viewer, okay? So it can take a little while to do some complicated things, but for something like this, it's not too bad. All right, so now let's let's add another data set to this one. There's a surface water data set I like called uh, JRC global something something. Let's take that one. We can also take a look at this. This has surface water data in this case, no, actually, I don't want the metadata one. I want the real one, surface water mapping layers. That's what we want. Bands, is this, so this image actually has a lot of different bands in it. Bands are basically data that are stored within the image. So we're getting a little more complicated here. Um, and I think for this case, we'll look at occurrence data. So I'll import that and I'll call this one water. Okay, and now I want to map this one too. And I'll call this one water. And we need to specify which band in this image we want to map here. So inside of my viz params, I'm going to do bands colon occurrence, I think you spell like that. And we can see here that our min is zero and our max is 100%. So the frequency with which water was present. Okay, so let's go ahead and I think just do min of zero and max of 100. So it'll show all of our data and now run that. Okay, now maybe I'll turn off SRTM. 
Oh, it's even more difficult. So you can see it's it's displaying on the river here where the water is, um, but I don't like those colors so much. So inside of my viz params, I'm gonna also make a palette like this from light blue comma all the way to blue. See if that works. Okay, that's better. Um, and yeah, let's see. So dark blue probably means there's water all the time. You can see this little tributary here has some light blue. I'll use my inspector to click on that. We can see the elevation is 381 meters. And the occurrence is that there's on average water 25 or so percent of the time. If I click on the main river itself, there's water 90 plus percent of the time. Things are not looking so good for the Colorado River these days. All right. Um, okay, so next we'll get a little more fancy here. So oftentimes I'll build my Earth Engine code like this because it's not like our markdown or something, it's, it's a little hard to stay organized. So you need to come up with methods like this, you know, using comments and some text to kind of uh, keep yourself on track. And now let's say I wanna compute the slope um, and add slope to this kind of map here. So to do that, there's a slope function. Maybe I don't remember everything about it. So I'll go to docs and I'll search slope here. And this is the one I want, this ee.terrain. So ee means it's an earth engine kind of specific function. Terrain means it's in this terrain package and slope is, is kind of what it does or you know more detailed name here. We can click on that and it'll give you some information about that. So you need to input into the function an image uh, with an elevation in meters and it will return an image. So let's try that. Um, let's see here, if I do this, I'll make a new variable called slope and I will make that equal to ee.terrain.slope. Ee That's my function, I made a mistake. And inside of that, let's pass our elevation model. Okay, and we put our semicolon at the end. We'll run that. That seems to be working. Okay, so now I actually wanna visualize slope. So let's make a new layer called slope. Um, min would be zero, maybe max is like 50 degrees and we'll call it slope. So now we'll run that. All right, now we have a lot more going on here. Zoom out a little bit. It's looking pretty cool. Okay, so can turn off water for now. I'll turn off SRTM and, and we can see slope. And I, maybe I wanna see what the slope is here. It looks like that one is pretty steep. So the slope is 53 degrees there. If I go out to the plateau here, slope is 1.5 degrees. Okay. Any questions so far? Can I get a thumbs up if you're with me or a thumbs down if you're not with me? Okay, I love it, I love it, thumbs up. Okay. All right, so now, Okay, so the next thing we can do is, you know, I, I think I might not live code this part. Um, I'll show you one thing. Another thing you can do is make a polygon. Okay, so I click on this polygon thing here. Maybe I, I don't like that color. Let's see here, I'll give it a cool color. I like purple. And then you can make a polygon like this. And now we have a polygon called geometry. Uh, looks like that. If I want to, oops, I can click on this polygon. I can move it like that. So maybe I'll, I'll put it here. You can change the vertices. So I want to look, just look at this one canyon here or something like that. 
Um, that's that's something you can do. Okay, but for the sake of time, I think I will move to um, the next script, which is apply a spatial reducer. We'll go to that one. Okay, so I'm just gonna run this. Oh, Wendy's asked, can, can you show how to import again? Do you mean um, import uh, a data set like this? Okay. Uh, so Wendy asked if, can you show how to import a data set again? So in uh, this case, I, I know the name of the data set I want. So, you know, I wanted this JRC surface water thing. And I want this one with the mapping layers in it, version 1.3. So I'll click that and go to import here. That's how I did that. You can code it indirectly. Um, I won't go through that right now. It's a little more complicated, but there are other ways. You, know, you, you can, in some cases, also go down to, where is that? There's some, um, you know, it's in examples. There's like data sets down here and you can actually like get code from these two. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, at the end of this, I'll share some resources with you, including the, the data catalog. And you can go and look at data sets in the data catalog and use the, they, they'll give you some code for how to import those too. So th th there's another way to do it as well. Um, okay, so let's go back up here to apply a spatial reducer. Okay, I'm gonna run that, you can see something is, my console turned yellow. That means something's happening there. Um, okay, so I'll try and go through this one by one here. We have slope. We just did that in the last little snippet, right? And now um, I have this geometry here. I wanna go see that again. So, okay, that's the geometry I made. Um, and I want to take slope, which is this thing, This thing I made here. And I want to use the reduce region function on that. So we get a parentheses and an open curly bracket. And the reducer I want to use is the mean. And the thing I want to reduce over is geometry. And for that, we're going to use you know my geometry here, which is this thing we just made, right? And the scale I want to reduce at is 30 meters. In this case, it doesn't matter so much because uh, it's, it's not a huge reduction, but um, you could run into computation errors if you're doing something massive and you know you specified a, a too fine scale. Okay, so when I run that, um, it will print slope dictionary and that, that image I've just made called slope dictionary. And so the average slope inside of my polygon is 24 meters or so, or 24 degrees. Um, another thing, you know, we'll, now we'll, we'll do an, a slightly more complex version. So in this case, and this is also another way to write JavaScript code. You can do it line by line, and it's actually pretty useful and pretty clever that way. Um, so I'm going to take my variable water, which remembers this data set up here, and I'm going to select the band occurrence again, and I'm going to do a filter called greater than, so dot gt parentheses 90, takes only the areas where occurrence is greater than 90. And then I'm going to do this slightly more complicated reduction where I'm going to multiply by the number of pixels where the occurrence is greater than 90. So all of the pixels where it's greater than 90, I'm going to multiply across all of them and then sum up all of the pixels. So in this case, my reducer is actually a sum. So you're not really, you know, re reducer is kind of a confusing term, I think, but in this case, we're going to sum up basically all of the pixels within that region where occurrence of water is greater than 90%. And in this case, there are zero meters squared where occurrence is greater than 90%. Um, so if I, oops, if I take this polygon and move it though, I'll put it over the main river here and run this again. Now we can check this thing here. It's not happy. It's 
still not happy. So let's see what's going on. You'd think that there would be water in the Colorado River, right? Maybe what happens if I change this thing to 99? Or sorry, let's change it to 60%. Okay, now there's, okay, yeah, there's, um, you know, 137,000 meters squared inside of this polygon of area where water occurrence is greater than 60%. Okay, any questions on that one? Okay, I'll keep it moving. Um, all right, so by the way, you, you can save stuff here. You know, this is a for for you. This is a read-only file, so you, you can't change anything. But if you wanted to, uh, you know, you're working on your own stuff. This is how you save, and you can kind of keep track of your files in these scripts here. Um, or you can be dangerous and just clear stuff and pretend it doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm gonna do some more live coding, but we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, start working with satellite imagery. I'm gonna work with Landsat imagery for this one. Okay. So let's import some Landsat. How do I get Landsat data? I think my internet's a little bit bogged down. Sorry. Let's see if. Give me a second. Sorry. It's not happy. So I'm, I'm guessing it's because running Zoom at the same time while you're trying to do other things is pretty intensive for computers mm -hmm. and um, and for your internet. So I think you can just be patient, see if it'll show up. All right, give it one more try. And if not, I'll just I'll just go to the pre-built code, I guess. Yeah. Um, the other thing is you might try turning off your camera momentarily and seeing if that helps. OK, let's try that. I'll give it five seconds. All right, I'll move on to my pre-built code here. This is uh, load and filter 04, load and filter and image collection. Okay, so what I would have done is, is typed in here and found this Landsat 8 collection, two tier uh, top of atmosphere reflectance image. Um, I can take a look at that. It's gonna be slow too. Um, okay, these are Landsat satellite images. You know, Landsat's been running for I think forty years now, or or thirty years, or something. Um, Landsat A is one of the more recent deployments of Landsat, and Tier One basically means that it's these these are like the higher quality images. If if they're having difficulty geo referencing the image, or there's a lot of clouds or something, um, they'll put it in Tier Two. But Tier Two is sort of the good stuff, and there's a lot of your classic remote sensing bands in here, like you know, blue, green, red, near infrared, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of different things to look at here if you want, but I won't go into it all now. Um, okay, so that's how I've imported this and I called it L8. And I'm not gonna run this line here because that's gonna take a while, I think, but you could see how many images total are in this Landsat 8 collection. And then, what I actually want to do is filter that down and just look at a month or so of data. So I apply this function called dot filter date and I pass it a start date and an end date. In this case, I'll go with 2016, May 1st to the end of May. Um, I'll run this. Okay, so it's telling me in, within that month, there's 14,000 or so images, and I've, I've mapped it to display it here. It's 
so we can kind of take a look at what's going on. Um, and for this case, let's go look at our hometown of Davis, California. All right, so here we are. And yeah, this is not the, you know, this is showing all of the bands of Landsat. So there's a lot going on here. Some of those bands have like really high values. Some of them are like the visible range values that are different, lower. Um, so we need to be a little bit more specific here with our mapping. Okay, so I'm going to add some viz params again in the curly brackets. So we'll do, um, yeah, I know that top of atmosphere reflectance, I think usually goes from zero to one. So we'll just look at zero to 0.3, um, just see how that works. And bands, um, we want to we want kind of a like a human friendly satellite image for this one. So um, I might take a look at this again, and we want to show the red, green, and blue bands in a way that the human eye likes to interpret. And from my remote sensing courses, I know that that would be band four first, band three next and band two after that. Um, so let's see how that looks. It's not happy. Unexpected token. Ah, this, this wants to be inside of the viz params. Okay, so that should work hopefully. All right, that's looking better, right? Okay. Um, and yeah, we've got to give this a name too, of course. So let's call it true color. Run that again. Okay, now our map over here is called true color, right? And we could do Another map, let's do another one. We'll take filtered, that same filtered data set again. And actually, you know what I'll just do for this is I will copy all of that code, do it again, get rid of that thing. And then we wanna make one instead that is false color. So for false color, you can do band five, band four and band three. So if you didn't specify which bands, it basically will visualize all of the bands and it will visualize them in this order, in the order they are in the metadata. So you need to specify which bands you wanna visualize and in which order you wanna visualize them in order to make an image like that. And to do a false color one, um, we actually use band five, which is near infrared. Let's see how that works. Okay, so I'm gonna turn off true color. And now we have false color, which basically makes vegetation look, look bright red. Um, and, and so this is just kind of an idea of how remote sensing works, how satellite imagery interpretation works um, and that by teasing out different band options and band ratios, et cetera, you can kind of start to look at different features in the feature space. So this, this makes vegetation look really red and clouds look, you know, bright white and water and stuff like that look you know, really dark. Okay. Any questions on that one? All right, so what I'm gonna do now is, oops, how did that happen? I lost my code editor. Not sure how to get it back. Oh, there we go, okay. All right, what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna, for the sake of this, get rid of the false color one and run that again. We only want to look at this 
true color one. And we're gonna be making a few more maps here. So I'm going to take that out of there. Those are my viz params. And up here, I'm gonna paste those and I'm gonna call them, I'm gonna make them a variable called red, green, blue, let's do red, green, blue, viz. Okay, so now red, green, blue, viz is a variable I've made with um, all of this information in it. And so I'll copy this. And now my viz params inside of my map.add layer function um, will just be this RGB viz variable. So we'll go up here and find that information and map it accordingly, okay? So that still works. Um, and then what I wanna do is, let's just take one image for now. Um, so let's see here, Sacramento. Let's look at this agricultural region up here above Sacramento. I have a question actually, I'm gonna check that out. Okay, so the, the message is L8 is not defined. How should I define L8? So um, make sure that your image collection up here at the top is called L8. And you need to import this image collection, um, USGS lands at eight, and then you need to call it L8. Okay, hopefully that helps. So let's identify a field we like. So I've clicked on my little uh, point geometry thing here, and I'm gonna zoom in on a field that I like. Let's see here, I don't know. Let's take, let's take that one. Okay. Now I have a geometry um, and it's that point. If I wanna go look at that, say I scroll away, um, I'm gonna go look at it. I could click here and it'll take me back to that point and zoom in quite a bit too. And then on this filtered image collection, um, I actually want to just, just take the images that pass over that point. So I'm gonna use a function for that called filter bounds. And I'm going to filter to geometry. Let's see if that works. Okay, nice. So now, it should be only giving me the images that include that geometry that are within this date. And you can see there's only two of those over here now. Got something in the chat. Um, Wendy, try, can you click between those two and type something there? Sorry, Wendy had a question in the chat that I'm addressing. Uh, that should work. If not, maybe try deleting this and then re-importing it again, um, or just going to my, you know, my code there should have it correctly, I believe. Yeah, Wendy, then maybe, maybe try um, clearing it and, and going back to my code. Um, but I'm going to try and keep, or just, just follow along with me for the interest of time, I'm going to try and keep it moving, okay? Okay, and Milagros is asking me to, I'll show again here. So this is my geometry here, which I'll delete now. Okay, uh, so I'll run this again. Oh, and I'm going to comment out that line and add my semicolon there and run this. Okay, so now it's it's giving me the whole world again, I believe. Okay, so you can see how these satellite images work, by the way. Like uh, in this case, I you know they they didn't get a very good image for some reason. Maybe it, you know the 
something was there's an error or there's too many clouds they couldn't georeference it well so they actually don't include this in the tier one imagery um so maybe if you really need that spot at that time you could go look for it in tier two or tier three or something but um yeah that's kind of that's that's how this stuff works all right so i'm going to go back to my davis area and i want to pick a field again that we're going to look at more and to do that you just go down here and click add a marker. Okay, now wherever I place my cursor, we'll drop that pin. So let's put it on that field. Okay, now we have a pin there. I'm gonna make it a better color because it's hard to see blue with, let's do something radical. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so now we have a point there and this point is called geometry. It gives the coordinates here. And I will add to my variable filtered um, this function called filter bounds and it will pass geometry, which is specified here and run this. And that will only give me the satellite images that have you've gone through that point so there should just be a kind of a rectangle here okay so um and there's two of them yeah so let's do another thing called um i think you can add dot first to it like that and i'll run this does not get it's not happy. Let's see. Okay, now it should be only giving me the first. So it's just giving me the one image um, because I use this dot first function. Okay. Another way you could do that is um, we could call this var image equals filter dot first. Um, so you could do it that way, but you actually want to specify that sometimes there's a lot going on inside of, you know, filtered might have a lot of different data in it. So I want to say ee.image. And so this is saying go inside of filtered, whatever filtered is, which is this thing we made here and take the first one. And that first one has to be an image. It has to be an ee.image object. So this will help you if there's a lot of different types of objects inside of whatever this thing you're passing to this argument is, okay? Uh, that should work. It's not happy. Um, is that gonna help? Not happy. Oh, well, that's because I gotta take this out first, I think. All right, so that's that's another way to do it, okay? Everybody with me? Let's see if I got any reactions. I got one thumbs up. Okay, nice, nice. If, if you're doing good, give me a thumbs up. If And if you have any questions or anything, don't, don't hesitate to put them in the chat. Cool, all right, we'll keep it moving. Um, okay, so what I can do now is We'll do our first kind of band math. This is exciting, right? Um, so we'll, let's do NDVI here. I'm going to get rid of this. We have our viz params there. We have our analysis here. Um, we have our user interface down here. And Okay, so there's a few different ways to do this. Let's just for simplicity, we'll call this the near infrared variable. Whoops, variable near infrared is equal to image dot select. Um, and we'll take band five. Okay, so I, I'll just run that sort of like running things as I add them one at a time so that I can tell if it's broken or not. That's working. Okay, now we'll do variable 
uh, red is equal to image dot select. And let's call that, I think, uh, band four, right? Yeah. Okay. We'll run that one. That's working. And now we'll do variable NDVI is equal to, so this is, we're computing NDVI, right? So I'm gonna take near infrared and from near interact, I'm gonna, near infrared, I'm gonna subtract, not very good at spelling, red, and then divide by near infrared. And inside of that near infrared division, I'm gonna add red. Okay, and this is how you compute the normalized difference, which is uh, what NDVI is. So I think that should work. Is that right? Let's see. Okay, it's working. So now I have these three new variables, near infrared, red, and NDVI, um, and we can map it. So I'm copy this, paste it, and then I'm gonna make this object here, our NDVI object. Um, NDVI, in, th in theory, it's a vegetation index that goes from, I think, minus one to one, right? Um, so we'll just look at kind of the relevant area, which would be from zero to one. And I'll call this NDVI. Okay. Let's see, it's a test. All right, now we have NDVI. Um, you know, for this, it's it's still within these dates, right? And we're still only looking at the images that have passed over this point. And you can see some of these, you know, productive fields. Remember, this is early May, so um, not everything's planted yet, but a lot of stuff is planted. And some of these fields have really dark NDVI, so there's probably a lot of growth going on in those. Um, you know, and out here, um, you know, where the stuff is maybe not planted yet or stuff is fallowed or something, um, it's kind of lighter because the NDVI is lower. All right, so that's one way to do it. Um, but because NDVI, NDVI is a really common use case, a lot of landscape scientists are using NDVI for stuff there's another way to do it. So I'm gonna show you the other way too. You can do um, pass image to it. And then there's actually a normalized difference. I'm gonna use control space to help me autofill it because I'm not good at typing and autofilling is my, my savior. And then inside of that parentheses, you give it some square brackets and we want the normalized difference between band five and band four, right? Yeah. Okay. Hopefully that works. Okay. So that's the same thing. So there's there's this basically just to show you there's a normalized difference function. If I wanted to learn more about that, I would go to docs and I would type in here normalized difference. And I can see that there's an ee dot image object from computing normalized difference. And I can read some more about that here. Um, that's relatively simple. So normalized difference is computed as first minus second divided by first plus second. Okay. Um, yeah, so another thing you can do is, let's say I wanna just look at NDVI here and I don't know, I'm, I'm curious like why NDVI is so high in some of these fields and so low in some other ones. So let's, you know, you can, this is another pretty powerful feature of Earth Engine. You can take something like this and scroll in and then turn this off. Actually, let's just decrease the opacity of it. And then you can apply this satellite background image. And this is, this is a, a mosaic of, I think it's Landsat and MODIS imagery that Google Earth makes. This is sort of what is typically on the back of their Earth, uh, Google Earth or Google Maps interfaces. And it, it's a good way to kind of just visualize and ground truth stuff on your own. It's not super scientific, but you can at least say like, okay, in this satellite imagery, like that looks like 
a rice field, you know, it looks like in this rice field, like part of it, well, I'm not gonna, don't go, don't go that detailed, but this looks like a rice field and this looks like, I don't know, it's, it's like a shrubland or a fallow or a wetland or something. Okay, and then we'll turn our NDVI back on and say like, okay, maybe that explains why, um, you know, why these are so dark and why these are so light. And, and actually these look like they have water in them. And I, I know some stuff about rice because I, a lot of my research is actually about rice in the Central Valley. Um, I know that they're, they're probably flooding their fields in this period of May. And so a lot of these fields probably have water in them in that period. And that in fact, maybe why they look so dark in NDVI, not, not because they have, you know, big, uh, green canopies or something. Um, but I would not, I don't know when this background satellite image is from. So I'm not using that to inform that there's water on these fields at this time. Um, that's more like, a, you know, part of my domain knowledge. Okay. Any questions on your first algorithm in Earth Engine? Congratulate yourselves. Okay, so now um, we're gonna get a little more complicated again. So let's do a function. Um, so we can, you know, if we're gonna do more complicated math on image collections or, or things that are sort of more in depth than just doing this over a single image, um, it's often useful to have your own function to do this. So, I'm going to just comment these things out for now. And the shortcut to do that, by the way, is go here to general shortcuts. Um, let's see, where is it? Command plus slash is a way to comment or uncomment a selection or a current line. Okay, so I'm going to do command slash. Oops. Oops, sorry. Command slash. It's not happy. So for some, I actually don't know how to do this with this keyboard. Um, I keep pressing command slash and it actually is giving me that shortcut um, tab. Yeah, so anyway, another way to do this would be just to do like this. Just put the slash and the asterisks above and below, and that will make that all comments for now. So let's put that kind of away and um, we'll make our own function. Okay, so to make a function, you use the function function. And I wanna make my function, let's call it add NDVI, and we'll give it something, which I'll just call IMG for now, and we'll open with a curly bracket and close with a curly bracket. And I'll put that closed one down there. Um, and inside of my function, I'll make a variable called NDVI. Actually, this is gonna be basically the same code as from here. So I'm just gonna copy that and paste that there. Okay, now I have a variable called NDVI that will take, um, take IMG, whatever IMG is, and add, you know, on top of that, do this normalized difference computation. And then, um, return whatever IMG is, plus I'll use this function called add bands. And I wanna add to IMG our new variable called NDVI. And let's just see if that works for now. Not happy. Okay, so we don't wanna visualize this one yet. Okay, so that's working. Um, let's see if I click here. All right, so let's actually print Um, oh, sorry, I'm confusing myself here. Okay. Um, all 
basically, basically what you need to do is actually give this thing a name. Okay, so we're gonna add rename and we're gonna call it NDVI. Let's run that. Okay, that's working. And now I should be able to map it. NDVI is not defined, make a typo. Um, I'm confusing myself, give me a second, please. Oh yes, okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, I missed a whole step here. What we need to do is make our variable called NDVI and we are going to use this new function we just made called add NDVI and to that pass our image. And our image is still this variable here we made earlier, which is um, you know, the first of these filtered Landsat 8 images, okay? And now I should be able to map it using this, okay? So let's run this, see if it works. It's not happy. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot an equals mark. I'm getting tired. Have an error still. Number of names must match the number of bands. Uh-huh, okay, so this is where it can get kind of complicated. So let's do print and DVI. I'm not sure what's going on here. So I wanna maybe take a look. I hope this will help. It's not working. Um, what's the trick? So basically the issue, which I know because I made this tutorial, um, and I'm not sure how to explain it right now, but um, basically we need, we need to spe specify which band to display here with something like this inside of the viz params and DVI. Um, and that's because I added this new band with my add bands function. I added a band and called it NDVI. And so now on top of this image are all the bands that were in it previously, plus the new band NDVI that we added to it. And so that should work. It's not happy with my printing. You know what, I think I coded myself into a hole here. I'm just gonna, for the sake of time, back out. And so maybe you're with me on um, make a function. I'm gonna go to that one, see if this works. Okay. So we still have this function here. I'm not sure, I was just messing up somehow and getting kind of stressed out. So I'm just gonna pretend it didn't happen. Um, Okay, but that's the basic framework for now. Um, we've used this function, we've called it and add NDVI. We take, an, you know, whatever IMG is, we add a normalized difference band to it and we rename it at uh, just calling it NDVI in lowercase. We're still filtering between these dates. We're still looking at that point only. Um, and we're still taking the first one. And then we make our new image called NDVI and uh, we use that by passing our custom function, this image variable, and then we can display it here, okay? Um, and now um, let's say I wanna look at more than just one image. I maybe wanna look at, you know, the entire season or something. So let's, let's play with our dates here. Maybe let's look at from February 1st, um, I don't know, until Thanksgiving time or something. So now we're looking from February to November 30th. Um, and instead of taking, you know, let's, let's comment this out for now. And 
Um, let's do, yeah, let's, let's comment this out for now too. And then we'll change this here to filtered. No, we want to call that with NDVI. Uh, and we'll put filtered dot map add NDVI. Hopefully this runs. Not happy. Okay. okay. Let's see here. It's not happy. Okay. We'll get to this later, but now um we're using the map function. Again, this is not like cartographic mapping. It's not a visualization thing. It's like a computational thing. Um, and so first I increase the number of images we're gonna see. So we're seeing this larger range of images. I removed this filter bounds to the geometry and we're no longer taking the first. So now if I print this thing called filtered, we should, see that there's going to be like a few thousand images in there. Um, it's it's a lot, okay? So it's, it's more than Earth Engine wants to do right now. Um, and to apply a function to a collection of images, you have to do what's called mapping it. So we're going to map this thing across the entire collection of images. And our thing that we're going to do is called at NDVI. Okay, so now let's... Do some new visualizing here. We'll call this with NDVI. Um, get rid of that. Comment that. Let's hope this works. Okay, so now we're still examining this image and you can see it's, you know, we're looking at the whole country again, we're not filtering to that spot. And we're also looking at this stack of images from February to March. And if I use my inspector to click on something, we should see all of these bands have, you know, this, this inspector will give us a time series of all these different bands. And uh, it's not the prettiest right now because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different amplitude for some of these values, but that's sort of the idea. And inside of here is a lot of information about all the different images that are in this image stack. And yeah, so this is sort of an, a useful tool. If, if you're doing time series analysis, the inspector is your friend for sure. You can kind of learn a lot about what's going on in here. Okay. Um, and you can see if, if I click on mosaic, it says we now have 18 bands. And so 17 of these are the bands that came stock with that image. And I've added to it, this custom band called add, uh, called NDVI. Okay. And another thing you can do is is sort of a trick is I'll add the dot median function to this thing and run this again. And this should load a lot faster. And typically if you have an image collection like this, it will display them automatically in sequential order. So from um, earliest to last, I think. And you can add dot media and just take the middle one to that. And uh, that way you just, just print one image for now. So that's another kind of trick you can use for visualizing. It can speed stuff up a little bit. And let's look instead at our NDVI band. So we can do with NDVI. I'll add dot median again to this one. And again, I want that band NDVI. Um, we'll do min zero max to one. And I want to call that NDVI. So hopefully that runs. Let's see. All right, so now we have both. 
Um, this is taking a while. So one way to just not, not print a certain map is just to add false to it, comma false. So our RGB map won't print. So let's run this again. You can now see how RGB is turned off automatically. I'm, I'm only printing the NDVI one. And we have NDVI for the entire planet. Okay, this is gonna take a little while to load, so I won't zoom out too far. Um, it's median NDVI uh, within these, this time period for the entire planet. Okay, so pretty cool. Um, yeah, another thing we could do, this is still like uh, a custom unspecified palette from zero to one, but if I wanna make it a little prettier, I could add palette colon single parentheses. Let's do from black to green. Let's see how that looks. Okay, that looks a little better, maybe light green. All right, that's looking pretty cool. I like that. Um, and that's it. That's NDVI for this entire, you know, for the entire globe. Um, now we can, you know, you can use inspector and click on something and kind of examine what's going on here. But there's also a way to code this. And to code it, you would type print. And then there's ui.chart function. And to that, you give the image and you want an image series. And we will give that our with NDVI object. And let's just select only the NDVI band. Um, and let's do that at our geometry, at our point. So our geometry is still, um, not sure how to, Okay, our geometry is still this point here that we specified. So I'm gonna see if I can run that. And then my console is turned yellow. That means something's happening. Um, and now this is NDVI from, you know, from February to end of November at that point. And I can make that bigger if I wanna look at it a little bit more. Um, okay, so that's interesting. So something to look at for sure. And uh, there is a way also to export this time series data. You, sorry, this is another nice function. You can kind of hover and you know, it's, it's pretty well developed already. Just get some information from this thing just by using your cursor. If you wanted that data in a CSV file, you could use an export function. I won't go into that now um, and, and export it directly. Okay, any questions? Anybody? Turn my video back on. All right, so that's, re that's really all I have today. Um, I wanted to kind of keep it short and sweet. I'll point you to some, let's see if I can go, I'll share again this. All right, give me a second. If you can see my PowerPoint now. Um, yeah, we can see that. Okay, and I'll also, I, I, I did a really feeble attempt at like a GitHub page for this, which I'll, I'll promise I'll add to later. Uh, it's really not done yet, but I'll put the link to that in the comment box here. So you can use that um, to get some of these links and the YouTube video, uh, I really recommend, this is sort of how I learned. And I actually really just kind of adapted and abridged the lessons the instructor takes in that video and use them for this tutorial. Um, and this one's really worth a watch. It's, it's longer and a little slower than what I did today, but uh, quite good still. Um, so I definitely recommend those if, if you want you know, to keep practicing. 
Um, you can also use this Earth Engine Guides uh, page. I'll show you what those look like here. Actually, let me do a new share, sorry. So you can see my desktop now. Um, this is the Google Earth Engine sort of tutorial uh, documentation. And there's a lot in here. This is really well documented. So if you are you know, trying to learn about a reducer, you might go here and there's all these different types of reducers. You can open this up, copy this code, paste it into your own Earth Engine. Uh, code editor and sort of play with it, see how it's working. You know, they're taking a max reducer in this case. If you're doing some complicated machine learning, like you want to do some classification, um, you can sort of get an idea of how that's done here. Um, this is, I, I literally use this code and adapted it for my own research. Um, so this is quite well documented too. Um, so I recommend both of those. You know this this whole Earth Engine apps page, um, and then I'll show you what the data catalog looks like for Earth Engine two. Oh, that might be the wrong link. Let me change that. Okay, this is what the data catalog looks like. So there's a lot of different data products in here that are ready for you to use. Um, and so in my case, I'm using a lot of Landsat. So I'll go to check that out. And the most recent Landsat is Landsat 9. There's only a couple of years of it currently, but we can check that out. And it'll give you some information here. And then also it, it'll give you this code here for how to get it into your code editor and do some kind of initial processing of it, take a look at it, uh, get an idea of how it's working. Okay. so. Um, this is another way to code your image inputs rather than doing them manually like I did in this tutorial. All right. And then um, finally, there's an Earth Engine Slack channel uh, at UC Davis that both Michelle and I are on. It's not the most active Slack, Slack channel in the world, but um, it, it, it's decent and you can post questions there and you know, we'll try to help you. Um, and, and my final plug would be just you need to find someone who is good at Earth Engine and and kind of ask them to check your code and you know spend some time struggling and, and then make sure you have someone that you can go to 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 check stuff out if, if you are trying to use Earth Engine to do your own research. Um, but I, I would start, you know, this was a good start. And you know, maybe if you want to keep practicing, check out those YouTube videos. All right. So that's all I have. I know I'm a little early, but hopefully that's a blessing to some of you or all of you. Uh, well, that's awesome. I'm, yeah, I want to plug to the geospatial email list. Um, there's quite yeah. a few Earth Engine users on there too. So it's it's a really quiet list, but it's a place where you can get um, not only workshop announcements and job announcements, but you can also ask questions there about the kinds of things you're you're working on. So um, join that if you're if you're interested. It, it's a pretty helpful place. Um, but thanks, Luke. This was awesome. I I'm always surprised every time I see Earth Engine how nicely it handles such large data sets and how quickly it processes things. And um, I've been struggling with some large data processing on a project. And now I'm thinking, why didn't I just do this in Earth Engine instead of R? Because um, it was taking hours to run my code and it probably would have been mm -hmm. quicker here. So <laughs> lesson learned. <laughs> now I need to switch over and use Earth Engine uh, for these big data processing things. Um, but thanks everyone. Um, what we can do is um, I'll turn off the um, recording and then we can stick around and chat for a few minutes if anyone's interested in chatting off of the video record. So again, thanks, Luke. This was this was awesome. No problem. Thanks everybody for coming. I hope it I hope it was helpful.